Dr. Larry D. Watson is an Associate Professor of History at South Carolina State University. Dr. Watson received a BA in History and Political Science from Millsaps College, Jackson, Mississippi, a Master's in Education from South Carolina State University, and a PhD from the University of South Carolina in African American History, United States History, and Early American Literature. Dr. Watson's scholarly papers include Martha Schofield and Elizabeth Evelyn Ryan, Women Founders of South Carolina Black Colleges, History of Stories, The Art of Teaching History Through Field Studies, and The Cotton Club, Jim Crow Comes to Harlem, 1920 to 1930. This is just King, his father's family, his siblings, but you know we can go into his kids as well, because you know his kids also uh, got into the ministry. So, so I want to start this discussion off by just saying a few things about Martin Luther King Jr. And and this is this is these are my comments. And I, I want to say first of all that it's, it's, it should surprise no one. It should surprise no one that almost all of Martin Luther King Jr.'s speeches are laced with biblical context. It should, it should, it should be no surprise because that's actually who he is. Listen at this. He was the son of Martin Luther King Jr. Sr., a former rural minister and son of a Georgia sharecropper who, who would, as King put it, who would marry up. Everybody know what I mean when I say marry up? Mm -hmm. Who would marry up and become the pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. He had long hoped that his namesake, meaning Martin Luther King Jr., would take up the ministry and thus more likely he encouraged his son Martin Luther King Jr to study the Bible. Now, if you're in the King history, 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 historiography, you know that, that neither his father or, he, or Martin Luther King Jr. name really was Martin Luther King. They, were, they, they had other names, and they changed their name. The father changed his name to Martin Luther King Sr., and then later on, Martin Luther King Jr. changed his name to be the same name as his father. That's, that's a little bit of a trivia we don't talk about, but that, these are, these are not the born names, these are changed names. Both his father and the junior changed their name to those names because, because uh, Martin Luther, of course, is a very important religious figure. But, but for my purposes, I won't keep going back to Marcus King. I'll keep saying Martin Luther King, Jr. So the father is a minister. He marries up by marrying into the hierarchy of Ebenezer Baptist Church. His maternal grandfather, Adam Daniel Williams, over here, was himself a minister. Indeed, in 1913, he took over Ebenezer Baptist Church, which was a fledging church, a struggling church, up there on Auburn Avenue. He took the church over, and through his skillful leadership and his foresight, he built into a pillar of the community, and the church became a very important church in Atlanta. His daughter, Alberta Williams, right here, were married Martin Luther King Sr. Upon Reverend Williams' death, Martin Luther King Sr. ascended to the pastor, to the ministry of the church. So when I said he married up, I mean he married, the woman he married followed by the minister of the church that he subsequently inherits. Not a bad move. <laughs> Not a bad move. So, uh, so, so, so that's a little bit. Martin Luther King Jr. mother, Alberta or Christine Williams King was president and headed up the Ebenezer Baptist Church Women Committee for some 12 years. Additionally, she played the church organ. And she and young Martin Luther King Jr. were immensely close. Martin Luther King Jr. was very, very close to his mother. And so she too encouraged him to be called the scholar of the Bible. At Morehouse, of course, he has a brother. He, he, I won't talk about him right this minute. At Morehouse, Martin Luther, Morehouse College then, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. came under the influence of, and, and these are my terms, of the teacher, the preacher, the mentor, the scholar, the author, and the civil rights giant from South Carolina, a guy by the name of Benjamin Mays. Everybody heard of him, right? Yes. He was Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, influence, Benjamin E. Mays. Uh, he's from uh, up, uh, up toward Greenwood in that area. He's not from Greenwood. Most people think that. He's actually from the country, 
but but the city, it, it, you know, we, I, I'm from the country, and I always identify with the closest town. It, it gave me some sense of uh, urbanness that I needed. <laughs> uh, the South Carolina boy Mays was himself an ordained minister. So here's another ministerial influence on King. Weekly, Dr. Mays delivered to the Morehouse student body these deep philosophical talks about religion, about social responsibility, about morality. So he shaped these men. If you've not been to Morehouse, and, and, and I can tell you the campus has an aura to it. If you go to the old chapel where May used to speak, uh, the, the Morehouse uh, uh, tour guide would take you to the chapel, and they would say, well, now that's the seat the Martin Luther King Jr. sat in right there. But then he can subsequently tell you there's some other people who sat in those seats who were very, very important as well. But King is the one we stand out that stands out in your mind. But that's who you're there for. But graduate degree in sociology at age 19. He enrolled in theological seminary in Pennsylvania and graduated with a Bachelor of Divinity degree in 1951. He earned a PhD in systematic theology from Boston University in 1955. Systematic theology is a very interesting thing because it is a, it's a scholarly field. This is the study of Christianity. It's an attempt to make sense out of the Bible. For example, the, uh, the, the, the Bible often talks about different things in different places and sometimes slightly different ways. Systematic theology is an attempt to gather those stories together and create some sense out of them. That's what King is doing. You'll see that in some of his speeches here. To earn a degree in this area, one has to be a scholar of the Bible. You have to read it, you have to know it, become part of it, it becomes, it becomes part of your fiber. Additionally, King studied at the University of Chicago Theological Seminary, one of the more prestigious schools in the country, the University of Pennsylvania, and Harvard University. This is a learned man. There's no question there regarding the fact that he was one of the foremost religious scholars of his time. His reputation as a skillful orator and theological scholar is indisputable. This, another rendition of the family. I just want to see what they did, the connection there. There is maternal grandfather, the mother, the father, and their roles, and of course his brother, who was a member of himself, and Martin Luther King himself. And if we took this another generation down, we would see some other ministers from the King family here. This is a ministerial family. It's not by accident. The king is here. What, what, what were the names before uh, changing to Marcus? Mar Marcus, Marcus King. Or oh, it wasn't Mar King. Mar so King was the last name. Yes, they were King. Yeah. They, they just changed the, the first name. And the junior had the, was he a Same, junior as Marcus? Junior okay. He was the junior the junior along. So both of them changed the name. Okay. The five, so at one point you got Marcus King Jr. At one point you got Marcus King which is the daddy, and then when the son changed, you got the junior junior. It's it kind of funny how that works out, though. Um, the Bible, because we're talking about King in the Bible. And if you were here Friday, you know, we talked about that, this Bible. So I want to just kind of quickly go back and put King in respect of the Bible. Because the King family, like most families, use King James Version of the Bible. Uh, and, and they, but it's kind of misleading to suggest that that's all they use, because they were, they're drawn upon a lot of other things, too. Listen to this. The King family uh, used King James Version of the Bible, and, and that because, because it should be noted that the King James Version of the Bible was the standard Bible in most houses. It should be noted that, uh, that, that the Bible has undergone more than 200 translations. Since it, in the 2,000 years since its origination, it's undergone more than 200 translations. 200 translations. Harry Singh and I talked about a few of them last week. And we could not have spent the whole day on this. But if you do, if you go look this up, you'll see there are so many translations. Some of them are borrowed from the others, so we kind of get this, this, this mixed up. It, the the Bible has only gone 200 translations, interpretations, reinterpretation, inclusion, exclusions, and countless other grammatical changes in its two to three thousand year history. And I use the word three thousand because, well, of course, I'm including the Old Testament in that discussion when I use that term. But in spite of this, as I said last week, I believe the critical essence of what this Bible is about still comes through. The Hebrews, 
the Hebrews began their original recording of the evolution of, of the, the Judo pre Christian narrative in early the 9th century BC. And modern Hebrew scholars, I mean, even as we speak, continue to research the Bible and continue to alter it. Of course, this was in various forms of the Hebrew language and for different purposes. And that would answer the question I was asked the other day, we were asked the other day about is, does the Bible have a political side to it? And it does. During the late Greek Hellenistic period, the narrative of the, of the Bible took shape in Greek, because that was the language of the era. This continued until around 100 AD. This is post Jesus Christ. By 100 AD, sometime before 400 AD, about 380 something, we're thinking, and well after the death of Jesus, biblical scholars began to record the Bible in Latin. This became the standard language of the Bible until the time of the Protestant Reformation, when strong and independent nations and language groups sought to have the Bible published in their own language, and that was my argument for nationalism. Indeed, Martin Luther King Jr. himself, his namesake is from the primary motivator for the Protestant Ref Reformation, Martin Luther. Martin Luther translated the Bible into German. In 1611, King James of England authorized the first official English translation of the Bible. And in doing that, he used the accepted version of the era. He used, for the Old Testament, he would rely on the Hebrew narrative and for the New Testament, he will rely on the Greek narrative. You see how he's trying to get around the Latin, because he's thinking that the Latin has, has, has admitted a lot of things. Try to use the Hebrew and the Greek, and not necessarily the Latin. Notice that. These are some of the more um, credible interpretation, translations of the Bible. The original Latin version here is St. John the Bogan. You see 382. About 400 AD, it's in Latin. Uh, a thousand years later, now imagine this. For roughly a thousand years, the primary interpretation of the Bible is given in Latin. There will be other challenges to it, but there will be heresies that will be wiped out. So Latin becomes that standard. We could probably spend some time talking about why the church was so guarded over the, uh, the Bible, uh, because it is a form of control. Monks, priests were brought into classroom settings like this, and they would be they would be given the scripture. They would record it at, because that, that created consistency and orthodoxy. Once you start putting it out there for everybody to look at, you get these variations, and we, we don't know that that splinters into many many different movements. We still have that issue. 1380, John Wycliffe <coughs> actually printed, published, translated the Bible into English, was not authorized. We intend to say in 1526, Dr. Singleton feels this is the best of all of the translations prior to King James. You know, this is in 1526. And of course, he did pay dearly. As you know, he was later executed. 1534, Martin Luther, Martin Luther completed his translation of the Old and New Testament. He actually started it several years earlier. So 1534, the year he actually completes it. This is Martin Luther Bible. This is actually the German tablet of this Bible. And I translated so you can see that what he's actually saying, the Bible, to see the Holy Scripture in German. That's what this means. I don't read German, so I thought I'd just go ahead and save myself embarrassment and trying to figure out what it means. <laughs> That's what it means. This is Martin Luther, translated the Bible for German. And many people see this in very, very political terms because in doing this, he actually uh, inculcated German languages and he, he preserved a lot of German language that may otherwise have been lost. And so a lot of what we know about German culture and language, we know because Luther uh, was very meticulous in going around talking to people, writing it down. So he saved that for us. Not unlike what, what the Greeks and Latin were doing with Christianity to a certain extent. But when you write something down, you actually preserve it as well. 1611, King James authorized. Just a second. Yes. When did he nail his thesis to the door? Was 15, that the train? No, 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 this is before 1526, I believe. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. this is before. Yeah. Uh, when, when, Martin, when Martin Luther first challenged the church, right. he, uh, with an FI thesis at the Church of Wittenberg, 
he, uh, he, of course, he has to go in the hat for a while. In doing one of his first hidden stages, he began the translation of the vow. Okay. And, and it takes him what by level. It wasn't tied years. to that. No, that. it was prior to this. Yes, yes. definitely prior to this. C.C. Eleven King James, uh, James Stewart of, the, of uh, First uh, Stewart King of England, uh, followed up on an earlier need for some consistency in the English Bible, authorized the, the, uh, the translation of the Bible into English. And he was very clear. He said he wanted the Bible in, a, in an English tongue. So he, like Luther and others, would want something in their own language. So I actually like to give credit for this to Elizabeth, because Elizabeth had talked about this many, many years earlier. And so, so a part of my feminist orientation is to give Elizabeth credit for this, although James gets the credit. Sounds familiar, right? <laughs> Woman does it, man gets the credit. <laughs> yeah. But, but I leave that alone. <laughs> Since the uh, fourth century AD, then, just a summary note. The Bible up on more than 200 translations and revision. At the time of the first King James translation of revision, more than 50 translations were used in England alone. Now, you want to know why James would need to do something? Because just in England alone, just in England alone, there are 15 variations of the Bible. 15 variations. And, in, and when he was charging these, uh, these scholars, these, uh, as, uh, these 40, the, the actual number, I always used 47. And I hear Dr. Singh say 50, and I'm okay with that since we don't really know. But, 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 but when he charged these 40 scholars to do something, one of his comment was that he thought that none of the versions out there were any good.